welcome to the Rock Church and World Outreach Center podcast. We hope that this message will strengthen and encourage you. Now here's a word from Pastor Deborah Cobray. If you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Mark, chapter 4. We're going to look at something tonight. I taught this. We're starting a series in uh, the woman's ministry, Girlfriends, and it's called Forces That Frame Your Future. And so I taught this a couple weeks ago, and I just believe that it's a message that I want to get to you tonight. I've tweaked it a little bit, but it's pretty much the same thing. And let me tell you what I mean by that. Forces that frame our future. That there are things that you and I do in our lives. Things and motions and forces that we set in motion that are actually going to cause us to have a certain kind of a future. Now, God does what God does, but God's commanded us to do what only we can do. And so if I don't know what those forces are then I'm not going to be able to walk in destiny and frame the future that God wants me to have in the kingdom of God as a daughter or son. So there are things in our life that happen to us, things in life that we make happen to us by our choices and by our actions that we need to be savvy about and we need to understand. And so tonight, the title of this message is Changing My Future. And what I want to do is I want to look at a law tonight, and this is just where everything starts. And you've heard this probably many, many times, those of you that are seasoned in the first three rows of the church. But I'm not speaking to you necessarily. I'm speaking to the rest of the congregation. And that is the law of sowing and reaping. And we find that the law of sowing and reaping is something that is set in motion in our lives. It's a force that will frame our future. Now, the law of sowing and reaping is clear in the word of God. And let me read it to you. We're going to look at at Mark chapter 4 because that's the parable that Jesus teaches. And he says, if you don't understand this parable, you're not going to understand anything about the kingdom of God. Now, I feel like I've got a guitar and I've got a couple of strings on my guitar. When I'm before you teaching, I, I pluck on these strings all the time. And one of them is that I have a recognized revelation and I'm not unique in this, that I am a daughter of the king, that I'm a citizen of heaven, that when I was born again, I was translated out of darkness, and I was deposited or brought into the kingdom of the son of God's love, Jesus Christ. He's the king, and there is a kingdom. Therefore, I'm kingdom conscious. I understand that just like there are physical laws on the earth that I have to understand, example, the law of gravity, what goes up must come down, right? It's a law. It's a law of physics. I understand that there are laws in the kingdom of God, forces that are going to frame my destiny and my future. And if I don't know what those laws are, then I can't operate them and I can't work in them. And sometimes I can violate them, especially if I don't know them. So the first law, one of the greatest laws in the kingdom of God is the law of sowing and reaping. What does that mean? It means what you sow or what you plant. Sowing is another word for planting. Now, remember, when the Bible was written, this was an agrarian culture. People made their living and ate by farming. You and I may not be farmers today, but we certainly go to the grocery store, and we know that everything we eat has either been grown and harvested or it's been butchered, right? And everything that God made, according to Romans chapter 1, speaks of him. Speaks of the Godhead and the kingdom. Everything physical that we see in this earth is shouting at us, is speaking to us, is teaching us. Everything is a learning lesson here on the planet. God set it up that way. And he set up the law of sowing and reaping in the natural so we could understand it in the spirit. So let's go. Genesis chapter 1, verse 11. I always put this on the overhead. Then God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herbs that yield seed, and the fruit trees that yield fruit according to its kind, whose seed is in itself on the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit, whose seed is in itself according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. In other words, each seed that God made had the ability to reproduce itself. It's the law of sowing and reaping. What you plant is what you're going to have. You plant corn, you're going to get corn. You plant an acorn from an oak tree, you're going to get an oak tree. You plant a seed from an orange, you're going to get an orange tree. You plant a seed of wheat, you're going to harvest wheat. Each seed has the power to bring itself to pass. It's programmed within the seed to be all that it ever needs to be. 
and it will reproduce after its own kind. Flesh to flesh, plant to plant. The law of sowing and reaping. Genesis 8.22. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, cold and heat, winter and summer, and day and night shall not cease. In other words, the harvest, the law of the harvest is not going to stop. As long as the earth remains, it is here, it is a principle, it is a law, it is a kingdom principle, it is a kingdom law, the law of sowing and reaping. In Galatians chapter 6 verse 7 it says, do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Whatever a man or a woman plants in their life, that is what they are going to harvest in their life. So if I'm going to change my future, if I'm going to be a part of the forces that want to plan my destiny, if I want to calculate and be wise and be savvy in what God has for my life, I'm going to have to understand the law of sowing and reaping, and I'm going to have to do some things in my life. Are you with me? Now, Jesus, in Mark chapter 4, begins to teach his disciples this law. And he tells them a parable. Now, a parable is an earthly story with a spiritual lesson. Because God knows that we can only see corporally what is in the natural here. We do not have the ability to see into the invisible world. We can imagine things, but if we do not physically see them, we can't know them. Are you with me? So, he takes the everyday ordinary things to teach us of spiritual laws. So Jesus tells us about the sower. It's the very first parable that he says is the entrance to the kingdom of heaven. If you don't understand this, he's told his disciples, you won't understand anything about the kingdom of heaven. This is the parable or the lesson that opens the door into understanding how you and I can begin to access and prosper and live well in God's kingdom life. Are you with me? Mark chapter 4. And he began to teach by the sea, and a great multitude gathered to him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole multitude was on the land facing the sea. He taught them many things by parables and said to them in his teaching, Listen, behold, a sower went out to sow, and it happened as he sowed that some seed fell by the wayside. The birds of the air came and devoured it. Some fell on stony ground where it did not have much earth, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Some seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. But other seed fell on good ground and yielded a crop, and produced some thirtyfold, some sixty, and some hundredfold. And he said to them, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now his disciples come to him, and they say, we don't understand. What are you talking about? Can you explain this parable to us? So let's catch it up in verse 13. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? So this unlocks all of them. So listen up, church, because he's about to teach us something we don't know. The sower sows the word. So the sower, the farmer, is sowing and planting seed. But Jesus, now he interprets this parable for us, and he says that the seed that the sower is planting is the word of God. And every word is God-breathed and God-inspired. And God says, as the rain comes down from heaven and waters the earth and does not return but gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall accomplish what I have sent it to do, and it shall not return unto me void. That's Isaiah chapter 55. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 says, For the word of God is sharp and powerful and sharper than a double-edged sword, dividing asunder the soul and the spirit, settling with all finality the thoughts and the intents that arise. In other words, God's word comes into my life and slices and dices right through my heart. God's word cannot return void. What God says is... He spoke and the worlds were created. He spoke and this was created, this earth. He spoke things into existence. The word, Jesus says, is the seed. Now I want you to take a moment and just remember that every seed in the natural has the power to reproduce after its own kind. Right? 
Well, the word of God is the seed, and every promise of God is a seed. And that promise, just like a natural seed, has the power to bring itself to pass. But it must be planted in soil, just like in the earth, in the world of the invisible kingdom of God, the seed of God's word must be planted, and let's see what the soil is. So he says the seed is the word of God. The sower sows the word. And these are the ones by the wayside when they hear it, when the word is sown, when they hear Satan comes immediately and takes away the word that was sown in their hearts. So now he's telling us that the soil is the heart of man. There are four hearts that Jesus describes in this parable. There's the hard soil, the hard heart. There is the stony soil, the stony heart. There is the thorny soil, the soil that has feed or thistles and thorns that choke the word, and there's good soil. So there's four soils in this congregation right now, and those listening to me online, there are four hearts, four types listening to this right now. My question is, if this is a force that's going to change my future, and if I'm going to have to understand the law of sowing and reaping, and if the word is the seed and the soil is my heart, then I'm going to have to make sure I've got some soil going that's going to actually produce a harvest. Are you with me? The ones that are sown on stony ground are when they hear the word immediately, they receive it with gladness. When they have no root in themselves and endure only for a time afterward when tribulation and persecution arises for the word's sake, they stumble. He goes on to say, and we'll get to this in a little bit. The next soil is thorny soil. It chokes the word. It chokes the plant so that the plant can't bear fruit. And then he says the last soil is the good soil. So there is seed and there is soil. The law of sowing and reaping. Now tonight, if this is a force that is going to shape my future, the law of sowing and reaping, then I'm going to have to understand some things. And I want to ask you a couple of questions, and I'm going to give you four things to do to begin to operate in this spiritual law. All right? I'm going to have to ask myself, is this a seed in everything that I do? You see, God says that we are very sin conscious, that in the church we can be condemning and we can be always guilty, be full of sin and full of the consciousness of our old lives or the things that we've done wrong. But God says, maybe I don't want you sin conscious because the blood of Jesus has washed you clean. And I need you to get out of that old nature of condemnation of sin consciousness. And I need you to get into the new nature of seed consciousness. Instead of being conscious of what you're always doing wrong, of what is never right, of always being on the negative, God says, Debbie, I want you seed conscious this year. I want you to understand that everything in your life this year is going to come in the form of a seed. And you're going to have to understand that instead of always looking at what isn't right, always looking at what you can't do, always looking at what this is or what that is, I want you to be seed conscious. What does that mean? It means that I think about what I'm about to do. This year, ask, what will this do to the quality of life here on earth that I'm about to plant? Whether it's a word or an action or an attitude, it's going to reap a harvest. Because everything produces after its own kind. Are you with me? Am I sowing seeds of negligence into my marriage by ignoring being a friend and a lover to my spouse. You see, everything we do in action, word, and deed is sowing something. And instead of being sin conscious, God says be seed conscious. Think about what you are planting with your words, with your attitudes, and with your actions. Am I sowing anger into my children? Am I sowing disrespect into my parents? Am I sowing indifference into my church? What I am doing in thought and action and attitude is going to produce a harvest in my life in 2013. It will produce a crop in my life. My life is subject to the laws of sowing and reaping. The law of the harvest will produce what I have sown. So to reap a desirable harvest, I'm going to have to learn how to recognize a harvest in a seed. To reap a desirable harvest, 
I'm going to have to learn how to recognize a harvest in a seed. To reap a desirable harvest, I'm going to have to learn how to recognize a harvest in a seed. Everything I do in word, in thought, and in deed is going to grow something. And before I say it, before I do it, God says to me, step back and become seed conscious this year. And before it comes out of your mouth, before it comes out of your life, before you start the action of that thing, understand that it's going to produce something after its own kind. And what kind of a harvest is it going to produce? If I want a good marriage, am I always being sarcastic and unkind to my husband? Am I indifferent to my wife and I don't listen to her and I don't pay attention to her, but I don't understand why the woman isn't a great wife? You see, what are you sowing in the marriage? What are you planting? Because what you're planting is what's going to come up in your life. Are my children disrespectful? Do they not care about us? Do they not seem to want to be with us? Well, what am I sowing in their lives? Am I sowing interest in them? Am I sowing genuine love in them? Do I put my paper down? Do I put my computer down? Do I put my iPod down? Do I put my phone down? And do I look into their eyes and do I talk to them? Do I gather them at the dinner table? Do I take time with them? What kind of respect and interest am I sowing in them? Because that's going to come back to me. See, seed conscious and not sin conscious. Ask yourself. What kind of a harvest will this action or this attitude produce in my life? To recognize a harvest, I'm going to have to learn to recognize a harvest in a seed. And the verse for that is Matthew 12, 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. A life is known by what it produces. A marriage is known by the Per, the product of its, of its life. Jim and I took our kids to Disneyland yesterday. We played hooky from everything, and we went off to Disneyland with eight of our grandchildren. We were sowing time and love and generosity into our, our grandchildren. We wanted to experience Disneyland with them for the 150th time. As I stood in line for one hour at Cars 2, Shaking my head thinking, only Disneyland is a place where the mouse has the people trapped. Nobody else is crazy enough to convince us that we need to wear mouse ears while we're on the park campus. And that we can stand in a line for two and a half hours to go on a three-minute ride. Are you with me? But Jim and I were sewing because we didn't have grandparents that we knew. We want to have, be grandparents that our grandchildren no, but we're going to have to sow into their lives so that we can reap a harvest. When we're dead and gone, we want them to remember grandma and grandpa. Not that we didn't care, but that we cared. That I was willing to go on a tower of terror <laughs> with my grandson. That's love. In order to reap a desirable harvest, I must learn to recognize a harvest in what I think about before I think it, what I say before I say it, and what I do before I do it. Ask myself, will this reap a desirable harvest in my life? What I'm about to do will have an unintended consequence. Is this unintended consequence what I want to see grow in my life? Because if we'll stop ourselves... And ask ourselves that this year. There's a lot of things we won't say. There's a lot of things we won't go there with our thoughts. And there's a lot of things we will not allow ourselves to continue doing. Because we are recognizing the harvest in a seed. Are you with me? So I'm going to have to learn to have selective seed sowing in my life in 2013. Just like a farmer selects the seed that he wants to plant for the crop he wants to have. If I'm going to plant wheat and I'm a wheat farmer, then I'm not going to go find flax. I'm not going to go find rye. I'm not going to find those seeds. I'm going to understand I'm a wheat farmer. This is the crop I want. This is what I want coming from the crop. I'm going to put the soil and the amendments in the soil for that seed, and I'm going to sow that seed. It's called selective farming. It's called selective Seed sowing. What do you want in your life this year? Ask yourself, in 2013, what do I want to see in my field? 
Now, I've got a picture of a field up there, I think. There it is. So let's just pretend that that's your life. That right now, your life can look like this this year. You can start fresh. You can get forgiven. You can repent of anything you've done in the past. God will give you grace to get through what you have to get through because there's going to be crops that you're going to have to deal with. But he gives you grace to do it. But now he says, start with a clean slate. What do you want in your life this year? Because there's your empty field. What are you going to farm? So I want to tell you about four things tonight with the rest of the time that I have left, which isn't a lot, what to do and how to farm it. You ready? I'm going to have to learn to sow seeds that will sow destiny in my life. Number one, I'm going to have to sow the seeds of godly desires. What I desire is what I pursue. What I pursue is what I will find. What I will find is what I will embrace, and what I embrace is what I become. What I desire is what I'll pursue. What I pursue is what I'll find. You go after it, you're going to find it. What I find is what I'm going to embrace because I want it. And what I embrace is what I become. So I'm going to have to sow the seeds of godly desire. You see, some people want money more than they want integrity. So they're going to cheat on their businesses. They're going to lie on their taxes, and they're going to go underground with their money. You know what you're sowing? You're sowing sin because God says, pay your taxes, be honest, a just scale is God's delight. Let everything come out into the light. Just believe me to make up the difference. So I can sow integrity or I can sow to the flesh and reap what the flesh is going to bring me, which is I'm putting myself not in God's hands, but I'm putting myself in the world's hands when I do that. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Godly desire. Some people want a spouse more than they want God, so they don't care that the Word of God says don't be unequally yoked. You're lonely and you want somebody, so you'll go after anybody that looks good to you. Whether or not they love Jesus more than they love you is not really an issue. The issue is that you're lonely. But you see, you are sowing seeds into a relationship where you as a Christian will be unequally yoked. And you're going to reap what that unequal union is going to bring you, which is heartache. But if you can wait for God and wait on God and serve God, God will get you to the right person or get the right person to you. Sons of God, some of you need to go hunting. There's some amazing women in this church. Women of God, some of you may need to paint the barn and lose some weight and make yourself desirable in the spirit. <laughs> Clean up our acts. You want a husband? What kind of a wife are you going to be? You want a wife? Do you have a job? Because God gave Adam a job before he ever gave Adam a wife. And you know, as a man, God wants to bless you. He knows that you're wired to work and be the provider and protector. He put that in you as, as the God image. And if you'll believe God and walk in integrity, God will get you a job. It may not be great right now, but you just do and sow and be honest and integrous, and God will raise you up in the ranks. So just start somewhere. But what are you sowing? Godly desires. Some people want pleasure more than they want work. By choosing the seed, the sower sets in motion a desired destiny. So, the seeds of godly desire. Let me give you a verse. Proverbs 16, 3 is an, in the Amplified is a verse that I've lived by. Roll your works upon the Lord. Commit and trust them wholly to him. He will cause your thoughts to become agreeable with his will. And so shall your plans be established and succeed. If I'm going to seed if I'm going to sow the seeds of godly desire, I'm going to have to give him my life and say, God, this is what I want. I'm lonely. I want a man. I'm lonely. I want a woman. God, I'm broke. I need a job. Roll your works. Roll your needs. Roll your desires upon the Lord. Give them to him. He will cause your thoughts to become agreeable with his will. He's the one that changes the way we think from the inside out. We can't do it, but he can. But he can't do it if a person's not willing to do it. Listen, God will not fill me if I'm full of me. God will not fill something that's already full. I have to empty myself of my desires and my thoughts and my will. And then when I'm an empty vessel, I can say, God, fill me with your plan. Fill me with your word. Fill me with your vision. Fill me with what you want for my life. And then God can begin to pour into me a brand new way of looking at life and brand new desires. 
So I'm going to have to sow the seeds of godly desires. When I was young, I had some wrong desires. I had to give them to God. I had to say, God, I die to this. And here I am, your vessel. And God began to turn my heart and change my thinking and fill me with his plan for my life. Roll your works upon the Lord. Sow the seeds of godly desire. Number two, sow the seeds of discipline. You can't have what you want to have only doing what you want to do. Let me say it again. You can't have what you want to have only doing what you want to do. I can't have what I want to have only doing what I want to do. Oh, let me, let me try it over here. I can't have what I want to have only doing what I want to do. I can't do that. You see, even Einstein said insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results. This isn't rocket science. God says discipline is a self-mastery that causes a person to do things they may not enjoy doing in order to enjoy the benefits of having done it. Hmm. Should I read that again? Discipline is the self-mastery that causes a person to do the things that they may not enjoy doing. Would I rather go play with my grandchildren and go play with my husband than hunker down and open the Bible and study because I've got a Bible college class tomorrow night and I'm developing a whole new curriculum? I can tell you unequivocally the answer is yes. But I can't develop a new Bible college class if I don't put the work and the study and the research in to get it done. You can't have what you want, what you've never had, only doing what you only want to do. Losing weight. I'm going to have to stop eating what I want to eat to get the pounds off that I want to get off. How about this one? Saving money. I'm going to have to stop spending money if I want to see my bank account grow and I want to save up for something I really want. We live in a world of instant gratification. Fast food, fast credit, and look at the mess it's gotten us into. We're in debt. The borrower is slave to the lender. The rich rules over the poor. And God says, you don't have to live like this. You can change your field and your destiny. But you're going to have to sow the seeds of discipline this year, Debbie. A better job. I want a better job. Really? Well, maybe I'm going to have to sow the seeds of discipline in getting trained. Go back to college. Go to, go get some training. Get a class. Go to a Votech school. Learn skills I've never had before. If I want a job I've never had, maybe I'm going to have to learn to do things I've never done. I'm going to go have to be an apprentice or be discipled by somebody. Maybe it means that you're not going to get a job, but you're going to go intern somewhere for free and just learn the trade. And bug them until they let you just hang out with them until you learn and see what they're doing. But I am going to have to sow the seeds of discipline if I am going to do and see and have in my life what I've never had before. I cannot remain governed by instant gratification. Doing what I want to do in the present may keep me from having what I really need in the future. Let me say it again. I cannot remain governed by instant gratification. Doing what I want to do in the present may keep me from having what I really need in the future. God's full potential may, may never be fully realized in my life. So I'm going to have to, number one, I'm going to have to sow the seeds that I want to see the right harvest in. And I'm going to have to sow the seeds of discipline. Sow the seeds of godly desire. Sow the seeds of discipline. Number three, I'm going to have to keep my soil good. Jesus talked about the parable of the sower. The soil is my heart. I can have hard, hard ground, which is sin. It's so hard and I, nothing moves me. Satan can come immediately and steal the word because I let him. He can't steal anything that you don't let him have. You are not a victim of darkness. Darkness needs to be a victim of your righteousness. My heart can be hard, and if it's sin, then what's going to soften the soil is repentance and tears. A broken and a contrite heart is acceptable before the Lord. If my soil is hard because of sin, then I'm going to have to repent, and I'm going to have to get real with God and let him break my heart. We sang it tonight. Break my heart for what breaks yours. God, my heart's hard. Sometimes I have to go to God and just say, God, I am a mess. I'm a pastor's wife, and I'm a mess. My heart's gotten hard in this area. Lord, I repent. 
I don't know how to soften my heart, but Lord, you said a broken and a contrite heart, oh God, is a sacrifice that you will accept. So Lord, I'm asking now that you help me change this. You begin to convict me. You begin to change me. Oh God, may I have a godly misery and a godly sorrow for things that I'm not sorry for right now because I've let myself get hard. And you know, when you pray that prayer, God will begin to work on your heart. And the waters of life will begin to soften that soil. And he can't steal the word out of your heart. Keep your soil. He said, the next is stony ground. I mean, that's the soil where as soon as you love the word, you hear, you're excited, you walk the aisle, you get saved. Oh, boy, I'm a Christian. And you walk out those doors, and as soon as persecution or trouble comes because of the word of God, because of your commitment, you're gone because you have no root in yourself. God says, oh, you don't do that. You're not able to handle this by yourself. You're a baby. You're still, you're still learning how to drink milk. You need to be in the house of God. You need to be here in the word of God. You need to keep yourself accountable. You need Christian friends. You need to stay in Christian atmospheres. Turn off that garbage that you're listening to. Listen to Christian music. Get in here and Pastor Jim and Pastor Luke and Pastor Dan are preaching. Go to Breaking Free. Get to Girlfriends. Get in every service you can. Let the word of God begin to fill you so that when the word goes down, the stones are being taken out of you and they're is soil that it can take root in. Keep my soil good. God says the next one is thorny soil. Man, you let the word of God come in, but oh man, the cares and the worries of life and the lust for other things, it creeps in and it begins to choke that word and you don't bear any fruit. Oh yeah, you're going to heaven, but you're not getting any fruit. You're going to get in by the skin of your teeth. Is that what you want? Or do you want to fulfill destiny? Stand before your king with something to give him in your crown. Gold and rubies and precious stones. As your life goes before the fires of the judgment seat of Christ. And it goes through the fires of his love. What's going to be burned up is going to be nothing. But what lasts will be stones and precious things in your crown that you're going to throw at his feet. And have something to give back to him. When you look into the face of endless, unbelievable love that has died for us and given himself for us. I want to give him something back. I'm not working because I have to. I'm working because I love him. I've fallen hopelessly and endlessly and absolutely in love with the king. My Lord, the king. He owns my life. And I don't want the thorns to creep in. The cares and the worries. And the subtle desires for other things. The choke. The very life of the word right out of my life. Keep your soil good. The quality of the soil determines the quantity of the harvest. The quality of the soil will determine the quantity of the harvest because he says the good soil, here's the word, receives it, obeys it, and keeps it, and it yields some 30, some 60, some hundredfold. You're programmed and made by God to bear fruit. You are pregnant with the kingdom of God. Your soil is rich. And he is waiting to take that seed, the spirit of the living God, your teacher, plant it in a good heart and watch that seed come up, push away the mountains of dirt and bring forth a soil that will bring 30, 60, and 100 fold into your life. Watch this video on what the seed does, and we're going to end with this. This is what a seed does. It's fast forwarded. So watch this. It's planted. Its roots go down. Now watch the mountains this seed is moving. It's moving mountains in respect to its size. Jesus said, have faith in God. Whatsoever things you desire when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Whoever says to this mountain, be thou removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, he shall have those things that he says. You just saw a little seed move a mountain of dirt. So God says, keep your soil. Why? Because number four, you got to sow what you have. You got to sow what you have. The quality of the soil determines the quantity of the harvest. And God says, I didn't ask you to sow what you don't have. You sow what you know. Sow the word that you know. Because that seed, if it's planted, will move mountains before your life. But it's going to take time. You can't see it working. 
You don't know how deep it's buried. But you know the promise of God, that seed, is growing and it's moving dirt. It's moving mountains. You can't see it because it's buried. You can't see what it's doing because it's moving the dirt here. It's moving a mountain here. It's moving a mountain there. It's moving mountains everywhere. And finally, it busts through that mountain. It moves it. And it begins to be the plant. And Jesus said, first the seed, then the stalk, then the corn. It's growing and it will produce if you don't quit and you don't give up. Church, tonight, I've preached too long. Tonight, God says, Learn to recognize the seeds of godly desire. Learn to plant the seeds of godly desire. Sow the seeds of godly discipline. Keep your soil good and sow what you have. Because the word of God is the seed and my heart is the soil. You know, I heard Brian Houston once. I was at Hillsong and I was, I was there at Color and I was speaking. And I heard Brian preach this. I'm sure, he, I don't know if he originated it, but I remember him saying it. He said, you can count the seeds in an orange but you cannot count the oranges in a seed. You can count the seeds in an orange, but you cannot count the oranges in a seed. God wants us to be farmers. God wants us to sow the seeds of the word of God in faith, in soil that has good and honest soil. So he says, church, you have no idea how many oranges are in one seed that I want to get into your life. But you're going to have to recognize the harvest and a seed. Before you think it, before you say it, before you do it, think to yourself this year, what is that going to produce in my life? Learn to sow seeds of godly desires. Let my thoughts become your thoughts. Let my will become your will this year as you yield to me your plans and your purposes. Sow the seeds of discipline. You can't have what you've never had doing only what you want to do. Be willing to do what you've never done to get where you've never been. He says, don't forget. Don't forget. Don't forget these things. Don't forget to sow. Don't forget to tend your soil. And don't forget that what's in your hand and what's in your life, the word of God that I've given you, is more than enough to bring a harvest that's going to change your destiny and change your world. The power of the Word of God comes into a human heart and it changes everything. Where you couldn't before, you can now. Where you didn't trust yourself to change, you know it is what it is. You ever heard that? It is what it is. I hate that saying. It is what it is. It doesn't give me any hope because it isn't what it is. It's what God says it is. And God says, I can have a new life. God says, I can change. God says, things don't have to be the way they are. God says, I don't have to live the way I'm living. I don't have to be the way I am. I don't have to just get by with the way I've gotten by, but I can have a whole new life. But there's some things I got to understand. And that's what I want to talk to you about just before we close this service tonight. Is that you don't have to have what you have, be what you are, and do what you have been doing. You can have a new life. And this life is such an incredible gift that you can't earn it. You can't work for it. You can only receive it. And this new life is given by God. It's not given by man because man can't give us anything that will have eternal value. It's given by the God who loves us and wants us with him. You know, you were made in the image of God. You're not some ooze that's slimed out of some primeval slime pit and became an amoeba and then became this and became that and one cell and another. It's some random theory, and boom, you're here. You were made by divine design into the image and likeness of God. You're not a dog. You're not a squirrel, you're not a lion, you're not an animal, you're not a plant. You are a human being made in the image of God. God made you on purpose for his purpose. But something happened. Something happened to us. Our parents, Adam and Eve, because it's true and it's real, it's not a story, it really happened. 
We're given a choice because God has given us something called free will. And God said, you can eat of the tree of everything in this garden, but if you eat of the tree of the knowledge and good and evil, you will die because if you break my law, you will be separated from me and you won't have life in you because I'm your life. We know the story. Adam and Eve sinned. They fell away from God. They handed dominion of this planet over to Satan. And you and I were born into this condition called sin. It's a terminal disease, and we're born with it. But God loved us so much that he didn't want us to stay that way. So he sent his only begotten son, his name is Jesus, to die for you and I. So that if we believe in him, we wouldn't perish, but we'd be joined back to the Father, and we'd have eternal life. Now I want to ask you a question. Do you know where you're going if you were to die tonight? You walk out those doors tonight because every one of us is going to die. Every one of us. If you were to die tonight, where would you open your eyes? Would you open your eyes in heaven with God? Or would you open your eyes in hell? Now, I pretty much probably think most of you are saying, oh, I'm not going to hell. Why not? What makes you think you can get into God's heaven? Well, I'm good. Really? God said, good people go to heaven? No, he didn't say that. He said, you can't be good enough for me because the standard of my goodness you can't get to. If you compare yourself with each other, you look pretty good to each other. But that's not the, that's not the litmus test. That's not the plumb line I meant. And how do you stack up to me, my perfection? You can't be good enough for me. So good people don't go to heaven, contrary to everything our culture tells us. Well, if God really loved me, he wouldn't send me to hell. God really does love you. He didn't make you for hell. You'll send yourself to hell because God says, I've made you not for hell, but for heaven. But there's only one way to God's heaven. It's his way. It's not my way. It's not your way. It's not the way of the culture. It's not the way of the trend. It's what God says in his word. And God says, I've made you for heaven. But the only way to my heaven is you must be born again. You must be born again. Your behavior can't get you to heaven. Your Religious affiliations cannot get you to heaven. Even knowing Jesus isn't going to get you to heaven because the devil knows Jesus and he's not going to heaven. And in America, everybody knows Jesus. You're either Muslim or Jewish or Christian. You're not born into Christianity. You are saved into Christianity by a conscious act of my will and your will when we say yes to Jesus Christ. Because God says the only way to heaven is my way. And God says you must be born again. Born again is a term that has been mocked by our culture, has been dragged through the mud, but it's what God said. And Jesus said to Nicodemus one dark Jerusalem night when the teacher of Jerusalem, the teacher of teachers came to him and said, how do I get to heaven? He said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. He began to explain to Nicodemus what that meant. He said, Nicodemus, I'm going to a cross. If you'll look at that cross and you'll believe that I am who I said I am, you'll surrender your heart and your life to me, all of your heart, all of your life. You'll be born again. You see, you and I don't have the power to save ourselves, but by believing in the one that did save us and has invited us into salvation, he can take me out of darkness and he can bring me to the Father. But I have to surrender and give him my life. And if you've never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life to Jesus Christ, then no matter how much you're trying and how good you're trying to be and how much you're trying to change your behavior, you're not heaven bound because you and I can't work our way to God. We can only receive this amazing gift of salvation. How do we receive it? Simply by faith. Just simply believe. Lord, I don't understand it. I don't get it. I don't deserve it. I haven't earned it. But Lord, I believe. And I want you to be my Savior. And I want you to be my Lord. I did that 37 years ago. Coming out of a drug culture back in the 70s coming out of a history of drugs and everything else, shamed and filled with darkness and lots of sin in my life, I stumbled in to a place that invited me to know Jesus Christ and let him be Lord of my life. And everything in my life changed and my destiny changed. I couldn't earn it. I could only receive it. So my question to you tonight is, are you heaven bound? Have you given Jesus Christ all of your heart in all of your life? Have you given him the opportunity to be your Savior and your Lord? Because that's the only way into God's heaven. 
And one day I'm going to stand before God and give an account of tonight. And I'm responsible tonight to tell you the truth, to love you enough to tell you the truth about heaven. So let me ask you this. Have you been running from God instead of to God? You need to get right with God tonight. Maybe you're like I was. You didn't trust yourself because you knew what was right, but you just never could do it. You were always disappointing yourself and disappointing God, and so you just didn't want to do it. But you see, it's not about what you can do. It's about what he does in you if you'll let him and you don't quit. So if you've been running from him instead of to him, I'm talking to you tonight. Have you been a good person? Better than I'll ever dream of being. Great behavior, great ethics, great morality, disciplined. But you've never surrendered all of your heart and all of your life to him. No matter how good you try to be, you can't earn your way to heaven. God's knocking on the door of your heart tonight saying, surrender. Let me have your life. And let me show you what real goodness is. Have you backslidden? Did you serve God at one time and now, man, you're a mess. You're here tonight. You're here. Why do you think you're here? God brought you here just for this. Because he says, come home. You can't screw up too much. You can't make God not love you. He may not approve of your behavior, but he loves you and he's inviting you back. to Come home. Get right with God. So all over this auditorium, if you've been running from him instead of to him, I'm talking to you. If you've backslidden and been a rascal, I'm talking to you. If you're one of those wonderful, good, moral people, but you've not surrendered your heart and your, and your life, I'm talking to you. I'm going to do this. I'm just going to count to three. I'm going to slap something. That. Just such a little mealy slap, isn't it? Jim goes, bam. And I'm just going to ask you to raise your hands all over this auditorium. And why do we do that with heads up and eyes open? Because we figure it this way. You know, Christianity is not for cowards. It's for people that are willing to love Jesus and let him change them. You can't walk up those doors and be a Christian just like that, that soil, you know, that has no root in itself as soon as persecution or you get a hard time because you're a Christian, you just fall away. We don't want you to do that. We figure if you can say yes to Jesus in a safe and friendly place and not be afraid, even though you're uncomfortable, then you can walk out those doors and you can learn how to live for him. I never saw them close their eyes and bow their heads in the book of Acts when they came to Jesus. It was public and it was with joy. There's no shame in this. There's only joy. So I'm going to count to three and I'm going to ask if you need to get right with God tonight to raise your hand just like that. We'll do it all together. Are you ready? One, two, three. Let me see your hands all over this auditorium. Raise them high so I can see them. I see that hand. Got you. I got you. I got that hand. Got that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Anybody else? I see that hand. I see that hand. Anybody else? Anybody else need to get right with God? I see that hand. Okay, let's do this. I see hands going up everywhere, and I really am not that good at eyesight and distance. So maybe there's more hands than I saw. So if you raised your hand and I didn't say I saw it, don't worry about it. We're going to stand. I want you to bring everything you brought to church with you tonight as we stand and sing this song. If you raised your hand, slip out of the aisle and meet me here at the altar. Let's get right with God. If you didn't raise your hand and you know you should have, it's not too late. Just come forward and let's get right with God tonight. Won't you come let's change destinies tonight. You are. Quickly come, just quickly come. Oh, and here. It's time to get right with God. You know it. Just come. Oh, come on. Come just as you he loves you. He's not mad at you. He's the only one that can fix you. I know there's more of you than that, but I can't make you come. Let's get right with God. I got a lot of spiritual personal trainers. They're still coming. I know there's more. I saw more hands on this. They're still coming. We'll, let you, we'll give you time to come. We've got a few minutes. You know, I'm not going to try to talk you into getting saved. That'd be stupid. But I can tell you this, God is real, Jesus Christ is Lord, and there's only one way to God, and it's through Jesus Christ. All roads don't lead to heaven. 
That's a lie. You've been deceived enough in your life. Isn't it time to face the truth and live the truth with God? But I can't make you come. If you need to get right, just get down here. Let's stop playing games and let's get right. Let's just get right with God. You don't have tomorrow, but you have tonight. You got tonight. Come on. Get, get your little butts down here. Well, if you know you should have come and you didn't, you're not off the hook. Just come back. Because at The Rock, we believe in inviting people to Jesus Christ for two reasons. Number one, because it's why he died. He loves you so much that he came for you. And if we don't tell the story, and if we don't give you the invitation, how are you going to know it? And number two, I'm afraid of God. I have a fear of God in me. I'm going to stand before him, and I do not want to blow this. I don't want your blood and your future and your eternity on my hands because I was too intimidated by the clock or by your faces to not tell you the truth. I live in a world of political correctness, of culture correctness, and all of this bull. But you see, I am a daughter of God, and he's the one that tells the truth. And the truth is, we are sinners born into sin. We cannot save ourselves. There's only one way to heaven. It's through God's Son, Jesus Christ. He loves me more than I can ever imagine. He loved me so much he couldn't live without me. And now he's inviting me to come and live with him. And if I want to be fool enough to refuse that and go to hell, then guess what? He didn't send me. I sent myself. And that's the truth. That's the truth. Welcome. Smile. You're not going to a funeral. You're coming to life. Now we're going to just do a couple things with you. We're going to pray with you because you don't get to heaven. Don't get, you don't receive Jesus by raising your hand. You, get, you receive Jesus by asking him into your life. This is Pastor Joel. He's going to take you into our new believers room. It's not weird. I'm about as weird as it gets. Jim might be a little weirder than me, but probably not. Luke is definitely weirder than I am. <laughs> and Dan, forget it. Dan's the only sane one around here. But anyway, this is Pastor Joel. So if you'll just make a right turn. Follow him. We're going to join you in there in just a second. You can meet with your families.